The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hi, and welcome back to The Learning Circuit. Today we're going to learn about electricity and magnetism. We know that with electricity, current flows when positively charged particles and negatively charged particles interact, with like charges repelling and unlike charges attracting. Magnetism also functions with positive and negative poles, but the source of those charges is a little different. All atoms contain electrons that orbit a nucleus. Each electron has not only an electric charge, but also a magnetic field. Like the Earth around the Sun, while the electrons revolve around the nucleus, they also rotate on their own axis. Electrons can spin clockwise or counterclockwise in their atom. The polarity of its magnetic field is determined by which direction it spins. Within a single atom, electrons can spin in different directions, some clockwise, some counterclockwise. If an atom has an equal number of electrons spinning clockwise as it does spinning counterclockwise, their magnetic fields cancel each other out. So an atom needs an imbalance of electrons spinning in different directions to generate a magnetic force. The larger the difference in spinning electrons in an atom, the stronger the magnetic force. The magnetic force forms a field around the atom. The field begins at the north pole and is terminated at the south pole, continuing through the magnet. When two magnetic atoms are near each other, they interact. Their like poles repel or their unlike poles attract. As atoms attract, they align and their magnetic fields add together, creating a stronger magnetic force. The magnetic field is made up of lines of force collectively referred to as magnetic flux. The flux lines are not physical, but demonstrate the strength of the magnet or magnetic field. Here I've poured iron filings onto a piece of paper on top of a bar magnet. The iron is attracted to the magnetic field. Can you see the lines? The strength of a magnet's force is determined by the size of its magnetic fields and the amount of flux that field contains, also known as flux density. The greater the number of flux lines per unit of cross-sectional area, the stronger the magnetic force. Neodymium magnets are harder to pull apart than ceramic magnets. They are stronger and therefore have a higher flux density. Flux density is greatest at a magnet's poles than anywhere else in its magnetic field. You can see how more iron filings are drawn to the poles of the magnet. Scientists and engineers express the overall magnitude or quantity of a magnetic field in units of Weber's for strong fields or Maxwell's for weak fields. But more often, flux density is measured in Tesla's or gauze. These units define the concentration or intensity of the magnetic field. A Tesla is defined as one Weber of flux per square meter. In equations, flux density is represented by a capital B. Some materials respond to the presence of a magnetic force while others do not. You may have heard of ferrous metals. Bueller. Bueller. Not that kind of ferrous. Ferrous as in Fe. Ferrous metals are those that contain iron. Iron is a ferromagnetic substance meaning it has an extremely high relative permeability rating. Permeability is a measure of the ease with which lines of magnetic force are established within a material. A material's permeability is usually measured relative to the permeability of free space. A substance that causes flux lines to bunch together more tightly than free space would be ferromagnetic. Ferromagnetic materials include iron, cobalt, and nickel. Free space has a rating of one. Materials with relative permeability ratings slightly greater than one are considered paramagnetic. Paramagnetic materials include gold, aluminum, and copper. Materials with relative permeability ratings that are less than one are called diamagnetic. These include anything that does not react to a magnetic field, such as quartz, water, dry wood, wax, silver, and glass. Ferromagnetic materials are considered to be magnetic, while paramagnetic and diamagnetic materials are considered to be non-magnetic. However, no diamagnetic material exists that can decrease the strength of a magnetic field as much as a ferromagnetic material can increase it. This will be important to consider later when we talk about magnetic shielding. Have you ever rubbed a magnet on a piece of metal and found out that afterwards other pieces of metal would stick to it? 
This is because it's possible to magnetize an object simply by placing it within the field of a magnet. Reluctance is the resistance of a material to magnetic lines of force. Materials with a low reluctance can be easily magnetized. When a low reluctance material is placed in a magnetic field, the poles of the magnet act upon the atoms within the material. The unlike poles between the atoms and the magnet attract. Like in a magnet, the atoms align, increasing the magnetic field of that material and the material becomes temporarily magnetized. The material's retentivity determines how well it stays magnetized once the magnet has been removed. High permeability materials have a low reluctance and are therefore easily magnetized, but they have a low retentivity, so they quickly lose their magnetic strength. Low permeability materials have a high reluctance and are therefore difficult to magnetize. However, they do have a high retentivity. So once magnetized, they tend to retain their magnetic strength for a long period of time. Most magnets are artificially produced by some external source. Since electrons have magnetic fields, their motion, like an electric current flowing through a wire, also produces a magnetic field or flux. One way to create a magnet is by using a strong DC current. This is most effectively done by running the current through a coil of wire. When current flows through the coil, the lines of force generated by the current add together to form a bigger and stronger magnetic field. We know that if a ferromagnetic material is placed in a magnetic field, its atoms will align and it will become temporarily magnetized. If an iron bar is used for the core, the lines of flux are concentrated in the bar and it becomes magnetic through induction. The coil-wrapped iron bar now acts as an electromagnet. As long as current flows through the coil around the bar, it stays magnetized. But once current stops flowing, the bar will lose its magnetization. The time lag between the removal of a magnetizing force and the drop in flux density is known as hysteresis. The strength of an electromagnet depends on three factors. The number of turns in the coil, the amperage of the current, and the permeability or reluctance of the core. The core of a coil can be empty. But for electromagnets, a ferromagnetic material is often used instead due to its high permeability. The remaining two factors are combined to calculate the ampere turns, or the magnetomotive force. Since magnetomotive force, or MMF, is calculated by multiplying the amps by the number of turns, then we know that having a higher amperage, or more turns, would give us a stronger magnetic field. Voltage in an electrical circuit is also called electromotive force, or EMF. Magnetomotive force, or MMF, in a magnetic circuit is like voltage in that it's the amount of potential in the circuit, just instead of electrical potential, it's magnetic potential. We're familiar with Ohm's law for electrical circuits. For magnetic circuits, we use Rowland's law, which states that magnetic flux is directly proportional to the magnetomotive force and inversely proportional to reluctance. Remember how I said that no diamagnetic material exists that can counteract the strength of a magnetic field of a ferromagnetic material? Since we can't cancel out those strong magnetic fields, we use magnetic shielding to divert them in order to protect devices that are sensitive to magnetic flux. Often a highly permeable soft iron ring is used. If you've ever taken apart a piece of electronics, you may have found one like this. Coils and magnetic circuits like the ones we discussed today can be found in a lot of different components. Solenoids, inductors, relays, DC motors, generators. We'll talk more about those in future episodes. If you have any comments or questions about what we learned today, don't forget to post those to the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash the learning circuit. Happy learning!